Thank you very much, Antonio. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my, last, my last presentation was to the Portuguese Hotel Association at the back end of 2019. So it's always nice to be back on the stage, obviously, during 2020, many, many Zooms, webinars, et cetera, but uh, it's always good to be, to be here. In, for some of you, ask yourself, where were you the day JFK was shot? I wasn't born, so I don't remember that. And then people ask themselves, where were you the morning of September the 11th? I was, I was working for British Airways, I was in Glasgow, I had a flight back down to London Heathrow, and I remember arriving at the airport and believing that tourism and aviation was finished. We'll celebrate, or not celebrate, but the 20 years of what's happened until 2020, aviation and tourism, exponential growth. The next time people will ask is, where were you in March 2020? And that is reality, you know, because if we look into excuse me a minute it's, uh, no if we look where we came as was being said before 2019 we had around 5% growth in tourism running around 1.4 billion tourists, significant economic impacts. And tourism had been growing year on year, aviation had been growing year on year. Everybody was happy, life was good. And I think what we realized is that this was gonna continue. In my industry of aviation, we were looking at around 5% growth for the next 15 years. And everybody thought, you know, why would this not happen? Everything was being made available, aviation was growing, hardware, plane manufacturing was being developed, but all of a sudden, something happened. And I don't want to dwell too much on where we've come from, but let's bring it back to perspective. We reached a low point of around minus 91%, according to WTO, back in April of, of uh, the period here of, of, um, of 20. And what you can start to see is that there is a general belief that maybe, maybe we're through this. What, what we could try and understand at the moment is what might happen in what we'd call a Northern Hemisphere's summer. We're in it now. In aviation, we talk about summer starting in April. But in reality, we're kind of in that pinnacle now where we may, we may get back around 55 to 65% of what we knew in 2019. That's obviously positive. From where we've come from to where we may be by the end of this summer, that is optimism. And I think this is what we need to think about. There is optimism. I think there are some very interesting things to consider. What's causing this optimism is vaccine rollouts in those markets where we're seeing penetration levels increasing. Confidence is coming back. And that allows people to start believing maybe travel can go forward. But what will change? I was listening to the panel. Things will change. You know, we, we, we need to think differently about where we've come from and where we might go. I think there was a lot of belief that tourism was just growing. Everybody was happy with what was happening. There was some little bit of movement, particularly in, in terms of starting to understand flight shame and a kind of a belief that maybe you shouldn't be traveling, particularly in the Scandinavian countries. Sweden had started to look at some sort of departure taxes on aviation, but this was really small. It was, it was a little bit of a movement, but if you think about where we were in 2019, there was a kind of a belief that sustainability and aviation yeah, let's talk about it, but then we're all growing, so everybody's happy. And I think what was being shown and said, it will change, and it will become more important to think about, and we'll pick up on that as we go through. So two things that will make that difference to what WTO have mentioned. 
vaccine rollouts and obviously where we're seeing successes, US, UK, now here in Europe, and I'll show you how that's then impacting upon some of the travel patterns. But I think what's more frustrating, what's more frustrating is the fact that we're not opening as fast as some markets would like. And there's no, there's no more disheartened than me living here, being a British person and seeing what happened with going from green to amber. And it's, it's embarrassing. I understand the realities of what that country is trying to do, but the mentality is, is that as an airline person, everything was planned, and now it can't be planned. And you know, that, that's taking confidence away from the consumer. And one of our challenges is we're doing really well on vaccine rollouts, but we're not correlating that with putting confidence in the market on opening of borders. It, it, it feels like it's gonna change very quickly. You know, we've got these few more months of uncertainty, but come September, come October, the world will go back to some normality. That's what we're hoping. That's what we're hoping. And I think that, that's the optimism that we need to pick up on, because that's where the numbers are showing that if we look beyond the next few months, there is some really interesting opportunities waiting to be discovered. If you look at Expedia, they were searching or understanding people's search patterns. Fascinating as it is, there is two schools of thought at the moment, particularly with international travel. I either travel immediately because of what I've just highlighted. If a border's open, look what happened when Portugal went from being amber to green. The growth of connectivity from EasyJet, Ryanair, was exponential. British Airways started flying from parts of the UK to Faro that they'd never flown before because they'd normally be flying to Ibiza or to Malaga. And as Spain was on the amber list, the airline put the planes to Portugal because it was on the green list. So the mentality of the airline was, we can move our hardware where somewhere is open. And as soon as that country is then closed, we'll move it somewhere else. Airlines had never thought like this. Planning of tourism... It's one year in advance. If you work in tour operation, you are now going into a period, you're planning for summer 22. Your brochures would be coming out in August to start selling to the tourists in September when they go back to work after the summer holidays for next year. You ask an airline today, they don't know what their forecasts are in July. If I go to the website today of EasyJet or Ryanair, I can buy tickets for flights in July, but they don't know if those flights are going because they don't know if the borders will be open. And these are the kind of things that are changing and this kind of radicalization of our industry. And, but is this gonna change? And will we have a revolving model or will we go back to where we were in 2019 with very long-term planning? From an airline's point of view, it's given them very interesting opportunities. We can move our aircraft very quickly. And actually, in 2021, up to where we are today, I'll show you a little bit more, we actually have more new flight routes, what we're calling route experimentation, than we had in 2019. We're actually doing more flights, more routes, than we did in the best year ever. Because we're trying things that we wouldn't normally have tried, because we're being forced to change because leaving my aircraft on the ground makes no sense. So that is one benefit of an airline over a hotel. A hotel doesn't have that opportunity. You can't move your hotel from a green list or an amber list to a green list like an airline can. So even in the worst of this pandemic, airlines have been hit the hardest it's actually the airlines that can come through this in a much more efficient way if it makes them realize that planning should not be one year in advance. You should be planning much more related with what's coming out from the consumer. And was mentioned earlier today about data, the importance of buying analytics and insights that talk about the next months and not trends in the next years. Because I want to know where to go quickly. So what the school of thought is saying is that we'll either have very quick travel, because we can, or 
we're a little bit worried about we're not yet double vaccinated. We're not sure if the country is fully open. Let's delay that trip to the US to next year. And that's really not good for our sector because, of course, if you're booking direct to an airline or to a hotel, you're paying today. And one of the challenges at the moment for hotels and airlines is cash. So what we're trying to do, and that's why I mentioned about airlines keeping schedules open, airlines want you to buy tickets, hotels want you to make bookings because they need that revenue coming in. If you book with a tour operator, maybe you pay closer to the time when you travel, but if you're booking seat only or on a hotel's website, they'll take your money today. And what you're starting to see is all of them offering you some sort of change facility, some sort of waiving of charges. Now, in the past, this is where some of the low-cost airlines made money. If, if I booked a ticket with Ryanair and wanted to change, sometimes it was more expensive to pay that change than to cancel the flight and rebook at the fare that I'm now seeing to travel next week. Because the model of an airline was, we don't want you to be changing seats. Flexibility, as we'd call it, wasn't available. And that meant that the project ancillaries, making money out of something else, is why EasyJet, Ryanair, Wizz Air, et cetera, have been so successful because they make money beyond the seat. And it's something that hotels now need to really understand as well, how to use ancillaries. So changing the mentality, things now or things very far ahead. The, the other part is that, you know, whilst we've had this pandemic, tourism has gone on. And domestic tourism is being talked about a lot. But actually, if you look back, domestic tourism isn't new. And actually, pre-pandemic, domestic tourism was, was actually six times bigger than international tourism. But it didn't get the headlines. Because we all did domestic trips, but we didn't talk about it the same way we might be doing now. Staycation has become the new buzzword. I'm going to stay in my own country. Generally, domestic tourism has been happening. You did a one or two international trips, and you may have done a couple of long weekends. But you didn't really talk about domestic tourism. And if you know, we had Lewis here, you wouldn't spend money promoting domestic tourism because what you wanted to do was bring people from outside of the country because you know that the domestic tourism will just happen. So at what point is this domestic tourism phenomenon, which is where we are today, is that going to stay? Or is it just a stopgap until we can all jump on planes again and go to countries? And of course, one of the benefits of tourism is to discover somewhere else because the grass is always greener on the other side. Interestingly, um, I'll pick Spain rather than Portugal. I'll talk Portugal later. Sp Spain ran a domestic campaign. It was quite interesting in 2020. It was basically an international video, basically in Spanish. What they were trying to tell the international tourists is that we have great beaches, we have great art, we have great food, great wines, and you should come from the UK to Spain. They took the same video, put it in Spanish, and told Spanish people, had you forgotten how good our beaches are, how good our wine is? If you think about it, that, that's what domestic tourism became. We basically just sold to ourselves because ourselves had always gone somewhere else because we didn't think our own was as good as theirs. Now, has that changed the mentality of the consumer? Or is it just a point in which we say, I'm doing domestic staycations until I'm allowed to go back to what I'd like to be doing? If you look at moving it forward, if I look at some data from the US, the US is at the moment the barometer of how to do domestic tourism. The US is booming with tourism. If you take the TSA, which is where you, when you fly internally in the US, you go through the TSA check to, get, to access the plane. So like security, internal security. If you look in the last month, sorry, I'm in the middle of it, but basically what should be May, we're back to the levels of 2019. That means there's as many people going through the US airports as there were back when we had no pandemic. 
That has got to be optimistic. Now, who's going through is all domestic. Back in May, because Europe yet hadn't opened, only opened recently to the US. So back in May 19, some of those people may have been coming to Portugal, may have been going to the UK. Now they're just doing trips in the US. But what this is proving, that if you, from the point of view of tourism, travel, the US today is nearly the same as it was before we had a pandemic. So they don't care. They're back. And even more interestingly, if you mirror that through, I, I, that's, thank you for taking me off. Some, this is the optimism, what the airlines believe will be their seat capacity for next month. As I said, you can't, this is not, you never know with an airline if they may change this schedule. But this is what they're forecasting for July. In nearly most of the cases, airlines are around 8 in 10 of what, they ex of what their optimism was back in the last time, in 19. You've actually got a couple of airlines, Allegiant and Frontier, those are the two big low-cost airlines. They're the Ryanair and, and EasyJet of the US. They've used this pandemic and this domestic optimism to grow exponentially. They're actually flying more because they weren't as big in 2019 as they are in 2021. So you've now got some US airline companies traveling, flying more seats than they were because they've used the pandemic to, tr to reignite and redevelop. There's also been two low-cost launches in the last month in the US. So whilst you're seeing some airlines believe that airlines are collapsing, in the US, you've actually got new airlines arriving. Only on Monday did EasyJet open a new base in Portugal. Wizz Air has opened six new bases in Italy in the last two months. Six bases. Wizz, EasyJet, Ryanair are not standing still in the pandemic. They're using it as an opportunity to go into those countries where they see worries. Alitalia, what the hell is Alitalia doing? Let it go. It's been going for 20 years. The government's still trying to put Alitalia back on the map. In the meantime, what's happening with Wizz Air is saying, well, we'll go, we'll go in. We know that they won't survive. And, you know, all of a sudden, there's huge potential just waiting to happen. This is the airport of the Yellowstone National Park. Back in March, was actually the fastest growing airport in the world. Not Emirates, not Dubai, not the new airport of Beijing, not Heathrow, not LAX. Bosiman Airport in Montana. Why? Because Americans wanted to have holidays. They were allowed to travel. And nobody wanted to go to LA or New York because they were being told to social distance. They were being told, go to natural space. And so an airport serving one of their most successful national parks became the fastest growing airport in the world. Pre-pandemic, they probably had five flights a day. What do we learn from that is that is outdoor tourism, nature, going to really take off? Are we going back to Paris, London, New York? They would say, yes, of course we are. What would that mean for Lisbon? So, you know, you're all of a sudden, is this a trend? As said from the, the dean of the school, if we don't change. So, is this a learning that we don't want city tourism? We want nature tourism? If you're a nature destination, you should be sitting there rubbing your hands like Yosemite, working with airlines to build capacity and change the strategy. But you'll see New York fighting back, saying, well, we're open. I'm sure Paris will be fighting back, we're open. So there's going to be a lot of new ways of looking at where people might go. But is this crisis an opportunity? I think, you know, you're, and people back home, you're in the field of making change. What did people say about our industry before the pandemic? It was very fragmented. It was brought up this morning from the president of Tourism of Portugal. Very little integration between the supply. Airlines, airports, hotels, tourism boards, travel agents, OTAs, they weren't linked together. It was very much my business, your business. And that causes in a pandemic 
a belief that we need to have some sort of fusion. So we had our problems. We were all successful independently. There was no kind of synergy happening within the tourism supply. I worked more with airlines, airlines and airports. It was a battle. They weren't integrated. It was that kind of landlord and tenant project, fighting over space, fighting over charges, not about coming together. Who owns the passenger? Well, it's my passenger. I'm the airline. They don't really want you, the airport, but they have to go through you to get to my plane. That was not. So we had a very fragmented business. We had a lot of small companies. Most of tourism was small. We think about major airlines, because in the airline sector, to be small is very difficult to be successful because of the economics of running an airline. But I remember when I spoke to the Hotel Association back in 2019, majority of the Portuguese hoteliers are independent. I think the big groups make up less than 5% of the room stock of Portugal. And we all think of Pristana Villa Galei as being, it's not, it's independence. There's a huge amount of small independent groups, companies that make up tourism be it across the world. The challenge has been that those have suffered because they don't have the banks helping, and that's why it's been so important that we've been looking at the ways to recover those companies that make up. And it's the benefit of the small, medium enterprises that have created an ecosystem of tourism that gives you so much offer and differentiation. Sorry, seasonality. You know, we have this huge, huge um, challenge in Northern Europe, or the Northern, Northern Hemisphere, excuse me, about North-South. And this idea that we holiday in the summer and we stay home in the winter. You know, so you create graphs that look like some sort of hospital chart. I was on a meeting yesterday with the Northeast, with the team of Brazil, with the airport of Fortaleza. Their, their seasonality is that as an airport. If I look at Faro Airport, it does that. And I look at Fortaleza Airport, well, they're on the tropics. There's no difference between summer and winter. So from the point of view, if you're going into there to have a holiday in the summer, it's the same as if you have a holiday in the winter. It's like Singapore, the same way. So the reality is, is that we have unfortunately got kind of crazed about seasonality. And this idea of stretching to what we call the shoulder months, March, October, November, you know, November in Algarve, it's good. Yeah, of course it's good. You compare that to the UK or Scandinavia, it's summer. So you can try to extend the shoulders. And that was a really important project to try to de desensitize this model of we make our money in four months of the year. How do we keep that? But of course, that has also meant that a lot of challenges in terms of managing costs. We've had over-dependence on tourism, you could say. Croatia, Greece, more than 20% of their GDP was in the hands of tourism. And if you look, certainly Lewis is doing some great work to be proactive, but if you look at you know, the way Greece and Croatia have kind of just exploded with doing kind of mass promotion, which is very uh, not so um, segmented, is because they're desperate. They're desperate because they didn't have an alternative to tourism. So that's made the fact that it's causing a lot of concerns that tourism was making so much to the GDPs of those nations. What are we doing now when we don't have tourism? And how do we get it back? How do we get tourism back? That's what they're asking. And finally, we had you know, productivity issues. Airlines, hotels, we were very static. We were very static. As I've said, now we're finally, we've woken up. An airline to be planning two weeks ahead. Never, never. Sorry, the schedule is, we call it the IATA schedule from April to October, November to March. I'm now planning the next season. But what about the, oh, no, 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 planes are planned. It's all done. But opportunities, no, 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 sorry. Everything's in the system. Now there's nothing in the system because we put something in a, into a system, but we can take it out. So there's good and there's bad. We're learning a lot in the next stages. During this pandemic, well, when we kind of started to travel again, so using the US a little bit uh, as a bellwether, there was a lot of perception about safe, clean, 
and Lewis has mentioned it's still a very important part of the project, safe and clean, etc. It is changing. Of course, this is, this is one of the questions maybe you'll ask of me. What happens at the end of this pandemic? Do we go back to where we were? We were told don't, because in five years you'll be dead. Or do we go back in a different way? At the moment, the airline industry research is kind of showing that in the past a few months back, we were keen to understand, will you sell that middle seat? How do I get on board the aircraft? Is the air safe? But when I'm showing you pictures of TSA in the US and levels of 2019, you're not telling me that people are that bothered anymore about some of this on the left-hand side. What they're really bothered about is what we did in 2019, 2018, which is how much is the ticket? And can it, when do you fly? What's the convenience? So all of a sudden, again, it's a little bit like domestic tourism. Is it a stopgap? How important is the things that we've been promoting a few months ago when we started to restart versus in some markets like the US where they're actually now not far off levels of what they saw back before the pandemic. They want the opposite. They want to know, they want the airlines to be talking to them in the old words, not these new words when we had a, what let's still call it, the pandemic. So again, we don't know. It's reacting to what people are showing us. So as confidence comes back, do we start to see people be much closer to where we were previously? And we stop thinking about this challenging months that we've gone through. And maybe the differentiators are peace of mind and convenience and not safe and clean. Which from a marketing point of view, it's a much nicer word, yeah? You never want to talk about a negative. To tell people you're safe and clean might mean that you're not safe and clean. You know, it's, it's just the way the mind works with psychology of, of, of marketing. It's much better to talk positive than to bring a negative to the mentality. So if I can talk about peace of mind and convenience, that's a far nicer expression than saying maybe you're safe. But again, we needed those terms for the times. And this is why I say every day, it's a new day. Until we kind of say, when does the pandemic stop? And when do we have that new start? We're in this kind of transition that we don't, we can always do something and we just need to then monitor how that works. Let me now take a little bit through some of the channels. Spend a bit of time looking at what's going on in, in the key supply and I'll pick on airlines, hotels, and distribution. So these are the kind of the big, the big bellwethers of where are we. This looks very confusing, but it, you know the model. Where is the airline industry? This is Euro, Europe's picture. If we take Euro, Euro Monitor, which are looking at all our airspace, basically at the start of this year, we're about 61% down on the same period in 2019. So we, we've recovered about 30% of the traffic in this start of the year. Now, there was a huge optimism that this would increase during the summer, mainly on the basis of the UK being a massive promoter of travel out to Europe. Now, that's not happening, as you know, with the green and the red and the amber, so there's a lot of, a lot of that capacity is now being moved away from the UK and being put into other big source markets in Europe, Germany, particularly as where there are opportunities. But what Euromonitor is trying to highlight here is that by the end of this year, we could have recovered somewhere between 25 to, th or we would be down around 25 to 30 percent of the end of 2019. That would be, that would make us about 50 percent percentage points above where we started really in March. That's the benefit we hope of this summer. There's a lot banking on this summer. The problem is that we're kind of in the middle of it already, and the numbers are not going as well as we would have liked. So it, it, I think you know, this is where you've always got to be careful of scenario planning. 
I think we've, we're a bit over-optimistic. The problem is, is that the airlines are over-optimistic. We have, in, in a, not to go into technical detail, but airlines ask for slots. And those slots, if you don't use the slots, the slots is when you land in an airport, if you don't use those slots for the next season, you wouldn't be given them back. It's like saying you didn't need them. So under the pandemic, the, um, the airline association lobbied the European governments to what we call a slot waiver. So if you've got a slot in Lisbon Airport at nine o'clock in the morning, you only have to use 50% of that slot over the year to have it for next year. If you didn't normally do 80%, you would have lost it. So that means I can say I'm going to fly, and I'm not going to, because I won't have any customers, but I won't lose the slot for next year when the market will come back. So we're sitting in a little bit of, let's call it a false position, when we look at scenarios of traffic. Because there's a, lot of, there's a lot scheduled, but a lot may not go. So that's the kind of realities we're in, but we, know, you know, we need things to work with as the best we can. If you take this to the next phase, which is try to take it across all markets, so not just now Europe, what you can see on the top line is per month, we talked about 500 millions of seats a month during 2019. We lost during 2020, around more than a half of all of our seats were taken out. What we're starting to see in the middle is a very interesting picture. We're starting to see aviation get back to nearly two-thirds of the capacity in 2021. What's driving that are three markets. US, I've already shown you the numbers, China, because China domestic is allowed, but international not. So China has pushed a huge project to have domestic tourism. And Russia. Russia at the moment is the fastest domestic market in the world. It's bigger than China in terms of growth. Russia, China, and the US are making up a lot of that difference between the bottom line and what you're starting to see in the middle. Because the international hasn't come back yet. So it's those really big domestic markets. India and Brazil are the two other really big domestic. They're suffering, as you could imagine. India was supposed to be really good. And then, of course, what's happened in the last few months. And Brazil, it's a little bit of not, it's still too much uncertainty. So, you know, in, in, if, you, if international travel could be back, that middle line would be getting a lot better. And just to kind of bring the airline thinking forward, we're talking about 24 being the point in which we recover. If we do, put into expectations, in 2019, we grew around 5%. And as I said, we're supposed to be growing 4 to 5% for the next years. So 20, 21, 22, and 23, we should have grown at 5% per year. We're only talking about 24 getting back to the level of 2019, which is significantly below where we expected to be in 2019, because we'd have expected in, the, in those four years onwards, we'd have been growing 5% year on year. So a lot of the airline vision has had to be completely rechanged, because in four years, we'll only be as good as we were at the point in which we thought we'd be 5% year-on-year growth for the next four years. So you can imagine the investor community has really started to look at aviation. And that's why you've seen, unfortunately, the industry have significant bailouts because the private sector has not believed in aviation to bail it out as we would have expected. And governments have had to come in as basically the owners to keep those airlines alive because the vision, was, the vision was growing. Everybody, and that, if I put it back to my earlier chart about what could we have learned, I think airlines were too greedy. The industry was too greedy. People say, the same, some of the hotel people in the room who are listening in terms of the real estate growth as well, majority of probably 70% of airlines don't own the airline. 
the air, when I say the airline, the plane. The plane is owned by a bank. The biggest owner of planes is the Bank of China. We lease aircraft on the leasing model. And like stock markets, like real estate, it was booming. You want an aircraft, there was plenty available on a deal. And you know, so airlines, but of course you tied, you tied yourself in to those planes for the next years, and now you don't have enough demand, you need to give it back to the owner. The owner doesn't want it because you can't give it to anybody else because nobody else wants airlines at the moment. And you can start to see why behind the scenes, Air France, KLM, Lufthansa, TAP, it's not been easy because all of those airlines, SAS, were all on the big growth projects with leased aircraft and now has to be relooked looked at. But the optimism is coming back. But as I said, we're coming back only to the point in which we didn't expect to be growing. Beyond that, if you can even think about that far onwards, but IATA, you know, the industry body of aviation predicts it, um, you've got to go a long way from that. I better jump on then, sorry. The other one to think about is what's going on with our hoteliers. It's all about more with less, trying to think about technology, how you use technology, how that technology supports the industry. The challenge of technology, how, do you, how can technology and hospitality fit together? Is there a way that you can blend those two models? In terms of RevPAR, which is how hotels monitor their revenue per available room, we're talking about five years, so 20 quarters, before maybe they are back to 2019 levels. So the hotel sector is not out of the woods either. They've got to, they've got to really convert business and try to look at ways of adding extras to support the revenue per available room. So it's not just airlines that are suffering. If you move that on to the tour operation side, here it's dramatic. Amazon back in the 80s developed a project called disintermediation. Disintermediation was removing channels. So you had book, buyer, rather than book, publisher, shop, consumer, buyer. Now it's book to buyer. The tour operator industry had been very much driven by owning the supply. I own the travel shop, I own the airline, and I own the hotel, and I own the land company that when you arrived. The biggest European tour operator here has just sold a majority share of its hotels. It's about to sell half of its aircraft. Tour operation doesn't own supply anymore. There's no reason, why do I need to own supply? Is it not better to have the ability to get bargaining power with other suppliers rather than me? In the olden days, it was always buy the supply because then you can have monopoly. You can control your costs. But in pandemics, you own supply that you can't manage. Who's managed well are those that don't actually have assets. If you've got assets, you're stuck. So the biggest tour operator is starting to sell off all its assets means we need to be differentiated and we need to focus on, on centricity. In the travel distribution, it's, it's revolution. And I'm sure some of the, the people in the room and on the, on the, at home working in the startups are very connected with the travel distribution networks. The old GDS, as we call it, is radically changing. What we're starting to look at is this bit in the middle, what we call NDC, new distribution capabilities, how airlines and hotels can talk to the consumer, can talk to the travel agent in a very much personalized way. You're wanting to remove the middle, remove the GDS, and actually just have airlines talking to travel agents, airlines talking to passengers, and through technology, there's huge opportunities to basically take out the middle. And on the B2C how we book our travel, well, it's very much looking at TripAdvisor, Booking.com, Expedia. Do we do pay-per-click and what, what's there? How do we work with commission if it's hotels or if it's Expedia? We buy and we sell in bulk. So to, to finish, basically, what we're talking about is I think we've survived. In most cases, we're through the worst. We've survived. Where are we now? It's this idea of returning and reforming. And I think at this stage, what's important to think about is what might that look like? We don't know, but I think 
what you're doing in, in relation to creating um, change, our industry needs change. We've, we were doing really good. And when you're doing, you know, there's always that expression, when you work in consultancy, there's always a belief that when you're, you're, you're most vulnerable when you're busy because you're not trying to look for new work. And that's really where we were as tourism in 2019. We were so busy, we didn't think about what might be tomorrow. Tomorrow hit us, and now we're trying to think what to do. And every day that is changing and changing and changing. And it is, those that will adapt will survive. But there are some grassroots, and I think what I've tried to show you, I think there are some nuggets of optimism, and hope that that optimism really becomes reality. We learn from the past, and we move forward thinking differently. Thank you very much, and all good luck to those startups with your projects.